What's up, Thompson Gang? Today I got T. Colin Campbell here talking about how dairy protein is linked to cancer. It's a must watch. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Raised on a dairy farm, milking cows. And, uh, and then when I went away to school at Cornell University, I actually then did my doctor's dissertation on the idea that uh, of all the things about nutrition we need to know and pursue was the idea that consuming animal-based protein was the most important. So my doctoral dissertation was exactly that, a little bit technical, but basically it was designed to figure out ways to make more efficient uh, our production of animal protein so we could consume more. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I was at a, my first faculty position, I was at Virginia Tech, where I was assigned the task there, among other things, to be the coordinator for a nationwide program in feeding Mellor's children in the Philippines. It was there that uh, I learned something that set me on my career. I learned, for example, that uh, I was wearing two hats. One happened to do with cancer research. The other happened to do with nutrition research. And, but I saw something that was at odds with what I just showed you, that the whole question concerning making animal protein more, more important. What I saw, those children in the Philippines who were consuming the most protein seemed to have a higher risk for liver cancer. Kind of an odd thing. One would have thought it was exactly the opposite, uh, but I knew that. I knew some work from India at the same time. It came out showing this with experimental animals, in this case, experimental rats, that were actually uh, being tested for their ability to form this kind of cancer, liver cancer. And so these researchers thought, you know, we, they wanted to know something about liver cancer because it's pretty prominent in that part of the world. So they thought, like many people would in those days, if they gave these animals more protein, they would be protected maybe against getting the cancer. So that's what they did. Just a quick summary. One group was fed 20% of total energy as protein, the other is 5%. One's on the little on the high side, the other's on the low side, but more or less the range that we humans use. Uh, and this was, these were animals that had been exposed to a carcinogen to give rise to the cancer, right? And they're very, very powerful carcinogen. It was the most, and still is today, most powerful carcinogen ever discovered. So they just put them on this diet, 20%, 5%. They said, thought, at least hypothesized, that the animals get more protein, they get protected. So that's the results they got. Not a big study, but they had that. The animals in the higher protein, they all got cancer. And the animals in the 5% did not. Really striking, as I say, I emphasize this is a small study. But nonetheless, because I was wearing two hats, going to the Philippines to try to introduce the consumption of more protein for these children, yet on the other hand, saying this. I mean, obviously, something's wrong here. So that's really what got me started to get involved in doing the basic research on this question. Is this true? I mean, I, I tend not to believe it from my own background. So we got money from the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute in particular, and that one particular grant then lasted for the next 27 years. And I had a lot of students, fellow researchers who got involved with me and so forth. Uh, and I just wanted to know, is there any possibility, this is true, that higher protein actually might increase cancer? So we use this model to understand that. I want to understand, too, something about cancer, because in those days we didn't seem, from my perspective, didn't know a lot. We sort of knew that cancer started with genes, maybe. Uh, maybe the genes had been mutated and so forth. But that was about it. There wasn't much to do with nutrition. It all had to do with environmental carcinogens. Um, so there, again, what, we, what I thought I saw in the children, what was produced here, both cases, more animal protein, more cancer. What I'm showing you here is a little experiment. We just did what the Indian workers had done. Feed, you know, all the animals had been exposed to a carcinogen, but then we fed one group 20% and the other 5% and looked to see what happened in the early part of that cancer, first 12 weeks, for example. So when we fed 20%, the cancer was growing really well, shooting right up there. Fed 5%, nothing. And this, now, both groups had the same exposure to the carcinogen. And keep in mind, carcinogens are those chemicals in our environment that we get so concerned about, environmental chemicals, if you will. 
a lot of people think we get cancer because of those. It's not really true. But in any case, here we got this really powerful carcinogen, just treating them with protein and saw the spectacular results. Among other things, I wanted to do, see what would happen if we changed the diet back and forth. Feed them 20%, let's say, for the first three weeks. Those early cancers are growing quite well. Feed them 5%, cancer went off. On, off. That was really exciting because there was nothing had been shown in that, or even given a hint that cancer grew in response to nutrition. It was all thought, and too many people today still think, that our cancer comes from chemicals. We'll come back to that a little later on. So we could turn cancer on and off. I couldn't have imagined anything, quite frankly, more exciting than that, being able to turn cancer on and off with a very powerful carcinogen just by manipulating protein intake. That was, uh, I'll get ahead of myself a little bit. And I will tell you, that's all animal protein. That's a protein of cow's milk, as many of you probably know. Plant protein did not do that, even when it was fed at 20%. So there's all something very special about protein of animal origin. Specifically, in this case, it had to do with the, the protein of cow's milk. That's why I'd like to show that story. I grew up on a dairy farm milking cows. And I, I just did like everybody else did. We ate a lot of uh, dairy and meat and so forth. So it's kind of hard to recon uh, reconcile that with what my own background was. And, so forth. Here's another little slant on that story. And that is that uh, if the animals are fed, I mean, if they're exposed to a carcinogen, the cancer doesn't grow if they're feeding 5% protein. And so I thought, well, maybe after, you know, 10, 12 weeks or so, by that time, that carcinogen would have already disappeared from the body. It wasn't around. What would happen if we just gave some protein then? You can see there which led to a really pretty exciting idea. And that was, and I can, I'll jump way ahead without all the data and simply tell you that we get cancer, according to this hypothesis here. We tend to get cancer because we've all got some genes that's been changed, been mutated, in one way or another with chemicals here and every place. We've got some genes to give rise to cancer, of all kinds, by the way. Some of us have more of that than others, but that's, that's kind of by the, beside the point. Those genes will lie dormant, as seeds do in a, in, in, a, in a plot of ground. They'll lie dormant, be latent. They won't, you won't be seeing them do anything for much of one's lifetime. It's not until we start putting some fertilizer on them, if you will, in this case animal protein, they start growing. Once they start growing, you can turn it off again. Gives you not, uh, sort of suggests something else that's very exciting. Maybe cancer can be treated by something like something crazy, like just simple nutrition too. At this point in time, I'm getting kind of exercised. I want to talk about it. Finally, decided to sit down and wrote, write the book at the insistence of my wife. Stop complaining. She said, "Write it down." Uh, and so, my son and I were sitting and working on this. And so, some of these very profound kind of observations were coming into, into the forefront. And I was interested to see, does any of this apply to any other diseases besides cancer? Here's a list. This list here is a bunch of different diseases for which there has been evidence in the literature for upwards of 50 to 60 years and ignored. Not in a complete detail, of course. The researchers were working in these areas. They didn't develop fully. But nonetheless, there was evidence. All of that sort of got ignored. And when I say ignored, and I'm talking about these diseases, Look at the title. The whole food, plant-based diet, in one form or another, prevents, suspends, and or cures all these diseases. So this is kind of an old story. This kind of sort of is an old story, and people didn't hear about it much, but and not nearly as detailed as what I just shared with you, but a lot of diseases here seem to be at play. The whole food, plant-based diet is very broad. As I say, it doesn't involve one disease. It's very fast. We know now people who have some problems, disease or otherwise, if they go onto this diet in 10 days, you'll see cholesterol plummet like that. You'll see a lot of things happen. Many of you may know about this. So it's fast, it's broad. And if it's sustained, which it needs to be, this diet thing is not a drug here, now take away later. It's something you have to go to, do it, and stay with it, and don't go back. So it's that kind of thing. It's basically a lifestyle. And one of the exciting things that comes out of this from my perspective of the research that we did 
was this possibility that the whole food plant-based diet not only prevents future disease we might necess not necessarily worry about, but the really exciting part of this message from my perspective, this is a means of treatment. Now we're stepping on some very sensitive territory because that's the purvey of, if you will, of the medical institutions. To come in and say, we, okay, we got some patients, that's the first thing we can do. Let's, let's put them on this diet. We already know now we have a lot of evidence, not enough published yet, but we have a lot of evidence. When we do that, remarkable things happen. So this story has become much larger. This is not some fly-by-night idea of you do this and you won't get that in the future, it's stuff like this. This is uh, the total package. Dr. Esselton, my very good friend, he and I became friends 30 years ago, actually, when he learned about mine, I learned about what he was doing. So I want to just put a comment here uh, about that. He, as you know, got a bunch of uh, heart disease patients together and gave them this sort of diet. He called it something different at the time. He was a physician and he was doing it that way and he got some remarkable results. Dr. Dean Ornish had started his work about that time, a little before actually. Um, and uh, so between Dr. Ornish, who you heard here this morning, Dr. Esselton, and actually another gentleman back in the 1950s who was ignored to be considered to be a crank, uh, Morrison, Mr. Morrison, they showed that heart disease in this case could be reversed. He had this study that he sort of did. He, after he did the first study you know about, then he came along and retired, same time I did, he was at Cleveland Clinic, I'm at Cornell, and he was still taking patients in and counseling them, and here's the way you do it. These are all heart disease patients. He goes back later and asks him, hey, you still doing that? A certain number did, 89% did, 11% did not. Those who complied with his advice, whole food may base, only one person had a cardiac event in the next two, three to seven years. The others who did not follow the advice, 67% of them went on. So I just want to put that in there just to illustrate you know, how this information, in my view, is kind of coming together. With, certainly uh, that had a great deal of influence on me, his and, and uh, Dr. Ornish's. Here's something else about this field that has been troublesome. And I've lived it, I've seen it, I've been involved to a great extent at times. And that is when this information started to be first told in 1982, the National Academy of Science report, there was a lot of interest in the idea that foods that gave rise to more beta character in our blood, were, that was a good thing because if you have more beta character in the blood, for smokers get lung cancer, they got more beta character in the blood, comes from you know carrots and greens and stuff like that, they got more beta character in the blood. We take the beta character out and put it in a pill, really make it good. A group of Norwegian and American scientists got together to do a study they did a study on heavy smokers, gave them pills, beta carotene. Another group, no pills. Then they saw what happened after five years or so. It turned out the ones with the, the ones who were getting a beta carotene from the food, sure enough, their cancer, their lung cancer, were down 19%. It's quite nice. But when they looked at the group who were getting their beta carotene from the pills, disease was increased. That caused a furor at the time that was done. That's now been shown for a number of different nutrients when in pill form. At least the general consensus in the field that nutrition does not come from taking nutrients out of food and putting them in pills. In other words, nutrient supplements are not where the game is. Yes, you can see some early effects of impressions of people, but it's not the way to go. We're talking about, and this is where the concept comes from, whole food. Let everything work. It's a progressive disease. Once started, it keeps on going forward. It doesn't go back. That's what we did in our animal study. We made it go back. But something really simple, but nutritional means. So they still operate on this assumption. Cancer is dangerous. We've got to take care of it. Let's get a drug. Let's find something that we'll call them cytotoxic. That means kill cells. So they invented a lot of cytotoxic drugs because you had to kill those cells. That's the only way you could treat cancer. That doesn't make sense. First off, it doesn't, they don't seem to work very well when you look at the data in the aggregate. And secondly, um, they cause side effects. You know side effects of cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs. That's, again, an illustration. Major drug, major problem with this simplistic thinking, just sort of talking about drugs. Incidentally, there's a statement taken off the National Cancer Institute that's the Institute of NIH. It says cancer is a genetic disease. 
as it's caused by changes to genes that control the way cells function. That's the first thing on our website. They spend you know, a few billion dollars doing the research. Actually, that institute did fund all of 90% of my research. So it's public money. The other 10% all came from the public in other places. So I've been really very much involved in the National Cancer Institute, both in getting funding, sitting on committees who, did, who determine who else is going to get funding, as well as speaking on policy matters. So I've known the institute from the top to the bottom, actually. And I've lost faith in the way that we work things, especially in this area here. They still want to stick with this idea. Hundreds of billions of dollars making these chemicals. Now they've got some new versions, not cytotoxic, but other kinds. Chemicals that maybe block natural killer cells, for example. Anyhow, it comes back to right there. That's why that study right there illustrating this concept. That we can so turn it on and off. Why are we then trying to use these chemicals just to kill the cells? Again, it doesn't make sense. I'm coming back to looking at the big complex mixture here and saying that's the drug protocol. You know, now we've got 93 or 95 percent of people my age all taking drugs. I don't take any drugs, never have. I did on a couple of cases when I once had a uh, whooping cough from one of the first cases. But uh, other than that, I don't take drugs. My wife, 78 years old, doesn't either. Uh, and we don't need to go down the drug route, but that is actually become the norm in this country. That's the medical system. Go and get your new drug. You know, collect money, go and do research, go and do that, and they tell stories after the fact. It does, first off, it doesn't work in theory. The drug protocol is going in one thing at a time and in complexity. The nutrition protocol, where you, if you get the right food, you get all this stuff working together, it begins to come into that system and works together as, a, as like a symphony. I like the word symphony. Single notes, even a single instrument sometimes, they don't make an orchestra-like sound. Same thing here. I want to think about it in a more holistic way. That's the word I rather like for that purpose. So I'm going to kind of conclude here. Holistic nutrition, I'm going to define it that way. Multiple nutrients, infinite nutrients, let's say. Multiple mechanisms, multiple disease reversal, multiple, all of this kind of working together. All kind of nicely woven together. Somebody's controlling all that. And we don't have anything to do with it, except screw it up. We're just not, we're not into that. And we haven't figured out how to do that. That comes down to the whole food plant based diet. Because it turns out that the best, the best recipe, literally, is that recipe that has a whole collection of menus made of whole plant based foods. And you get these remarkable effects across the board. And I, I'm calling it a fact of nature. It's a fact of nature. And that's what's got me so excited about it. And when you start thinking about it that way, and then I, this book I'm working on right now it went back into the history of this field, back to the 1700s. And I found some really interesting uh, things going on at that time to begin to explain why we got into the wrong track. We, drew, we had an idea then back in the 1800s. And it was closer to what I'm talking about, and we rejected it. Instead, we chose the drug route. Now we have what we have. That's not exactly a pretty story. So I say this holist nutrition is a highly interactive, integrated holist system with a W on it, minus the cult of animal protein. I, don't, I haven't had a got a chance to get into you to tell you the story about animal protein. The argument for the vegetarian vegan diets, for example, has largely been an ethical one, as all of you may know. It's not a scientific one. It's that it really hasn't done a very good job that way. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, it's a good idea, yes. I, I, I support that, that, that sort of thing. But in the process, that was a reaction against the consumption of animals for good reasons. I didn't get there that way. I get here through what I didn't get a chance to describe to you. An argument why we should never have ever eaten.